Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to International Relations this week. Under this series, we cover all the important geopolitical developments of the last one week with special focus on UPSC prelims and mains examination. So under episode 87, we shall be covering important geopolitical developments of the last one week. Before we begin, do extend your support to the initiative by pressing the like button, share these videos with fellow aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's take a look at the topics that we are going to cover today. We're going to discuss about the UN Charter and a related topic that is the G4 and the UN reforms. Both these topics were very much in news last week because of the 77th session of the UN General Assembly that was held last week in New York where the UN is headquartered. So there were many key developments at the United Nations involving India. So it becomes relevant in that context to talk about the UN Charter and UN reforms in particular. Because both these topics and issues were brought up by various countries including India. After this we are going to talk about the Paris Club and we shall also discuss the latest developments regarding the Russia-Ukraine war. Specifically Russia's orders to mobilize troops in order to step up its aggression against Ukraine. So we shall cover all these key topics today one by one and let's begin with the first topic that is UN Charter. As I mentioned the topic of United Nations was in news because of the 77th UN General Assembly session that was held in New York last week. India also participated actively in the session as it always does and India's Foreign Minister Dr. S. Jai Shankar he specifically pointed out India's position on the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict. In this regard India's Foreign Minister said that India is firmly committed to the UN Charter and its principles and expects all the UN members as well to remain committed to the principles of the UN Charter. This was an indirect message that India was sending out to Russia to put an end to its war against Ukraine. So that's one reason why the UN Charter was in news. In the same context, US President Joe Biden, who also addressed the UN General Assembly session, he criticized Russia for shamelessly violating the core tenets, the core beliefs and principles that are enshrined in the UN Charter. So it's in this context that we, knew, we need to know what is the UN Charter. What is the UN Charter? What is its relevance? And what are the key principles and objectives that have been outlined under the UN Charter? See, the UN Charter is the foundational agreement of the United Nations itself. It is essentially the constitution of the United Nations. It is a constitutive instrument of the UN which was brought out through the San Francisco Conference of 1945. It was the San Francisco Conference of 1945 which laid the foundation for the UN. I am sure many of you would know that before the United Nations was established, we had a global institution called the League of Nations. The League of Nations which was formed after the First World War back in 1919. The primary mandate of League of Nations was to prevent another global conflict, to establish peace and sec security and to stabilize the world. But clearly the League of Nations failed in its mandate because in many ways the League of Nations contributed to the Second World War. So as the Second World War was winding down, then US President Franklin Roosevelt, he proposed the idea of a new global institution and he referred to it as the United Nations, as an organization where all nations could come together and take a united stand for the global, for the global good. And he proposed this idea as a replacement to the League of Nations. So this idea proposed by Franklin Roosevelt led to the San Francisco Conference, the United Nations Conference on International Organization in 1945. So at this conference, delegates from around the world, from various sovereign states and even from yet to be independent countries including India, they participated and they contributed to the negotiations for establishing a new global body called the UN that could replace the League of Nations. 
So at the San Francisco conference, they finally came out with a document, a legal document called the UN Charter, which would become the constitutive instrument or basically the foundational agreement or the constitution of this new organization called the UN. So this is the UN Charter. It is the constitution of the United Nations that was signed in 1945 and it basically defines the rights and obligations of all the member countries and it lays down the mandate of this organization. It specifically identifies the objectives of the UN, the core principles, the core beliefs of the UN, places certain duties and obligations on the member countries and also identifies the rights of member states. This document, the UN Charter, also established the principal organs of the United Nations, the six principal organs of the UN and the procedures that would govern their functioning. The legal procedures that would govern their functioning and the administration of the UN, they've all been defined under the UN Charter. So that is why this document is seen as the foundational agreement of the United Nations. So all the member states of the UN, they have a legal binding, they have a legal, legally binding commitment towards the UN Charter. They are required to uphold the principles, the beliefs of the UN Charter and firmly remained, remain committed to their obligations and duties that are laid down through the UN Charter. So that's the reason why the UN Charter is a very significant document as far as international relations are concerned. Here you see the preamble to the UN Charter. If you go through the preamble, you will notice that the Charter refers to the global community as we the peoples of the United Nations. Essentially the global community is taking a pledge through the preamble of the UN Charter. The pledge is to remain determined to prevent another conflict, another global conflict that could destroy future generations. To ensure that peace and stability is maintained in the world by learning lessons from the world wars which cause immense suffering to mankind. To ensure that basic human rights are respected around the world and equal rights are provided to men, women and people of all religion, caste, sex, etc. There was a commitment enshrined to ensure justice to the global community, ensure respect towards international law, the international rules have to be respected and followed and to focus on welfare, to focus on socio-economic de development and to promote social progress around the world. So to achieve these egalitarian objectives, the United Nations committed all the member states to live together in tolerance, to live as good neighbors, to live as good partners in the international community and to strive towards maintaining peace and security. The focus was on respecting the principles of the institution which was mandated to uphold these core beliefs. So the United Nations which started functioning from 1945 has been governed by this legal document called the UN Charter. It defines the mandate of the organization and as mentioned it identifies the rights and duties of all the members and more importantly it established the structure and the functions of the UN. It created the principal organs and established the functions which govern their day-to-day -day functioning. So in this context, it's very important to understand the mandate of the UN, the core beliefs of the UN as outlined under the UN Charter. This could be very important for both your prelims and as well as for your mates. So by looking at the preamble and by going through all the articles that are there, we can simplify the mandate of the UN into these four or five points. The primary mandate of UN is to maintain international peace and security. The objective is to prevent wars and conflicts. Ensure that disputes are peacefully resolved through talks and negotiations. Ensure that disputes between countries do not result in the breakout of a larger war or a conflict. So that is how the UN has been mandated to maintain peace and security and to stabilize the world. For this, 
it requires the enforcement of international law the member countries they have to abide by international rules uphold international law and respect the core principles that have been brought out by the un charter so this was the core mandate of the un the primary function along with that it was mandated to focus on socio economic development because after the world wars there was a renewed focus on welfare the world wars had ravaged the global economy it had destroyed many countries so now countries were looking to rebuild their economies from scratch the concept of welfare state was being promoted and the un was given a lead role to focus on socio economic development as well so its priority was to promote international cooperation between the member states so countries can work together assist each other to improve the standard of living to improve the education and healthcare standards address the issues of poverty hunger etc provide for protection of environment and ensure the overall well being of the global co community essentially the welfare model was promoted with focus on social economic and health related development this became a priority area for this new organization and finally the un was mandated to promote a universal respect for human rights human rights was given at most priority through the un charter because again the world wars had led to large scale human right violations around the world especially under the axis powers there were large scale atrocities reported around the world under nazi germany imperial japan mass atrocities were committed and hence the un was mandated to uphold and promote a universal respect for human rights and ensure that basic freedoms basic rights are guaranteed equally to all sections of the society irrespective of race sex language religion etc so protection promotion of human rights became a top focus for the un along with this the un would also focus on providing assistance providing relief to those who are affected by disasters this could be natural disasters environmental disasters or even man made disasters because the global community was learning the impact of war the enormous destruction that war causes the suffering that war brings about the global community also saw significant environmental damage due to pollution caused by the global conflicts the war in itself contributed to environmental pollution the sudden increase in industrial activities especially arms production and the consequential impact of the industrial revolution had started showing up by 1940s so now there was focus on environmental protection as well and attention was being given to disasters natural disasters as well so those who are suffering from famines and the impact of let's say droughts floods they were supposed to be assisted provided relief through the un along with those who are suffering from the impact of war which is essentially a man made disaster so these are the core mandates of the un that were laid out under this important document called the un charter this document establishes the six principal organs of the un which you can see listed over here so the six key organs or the primary organs of the un includes the un general assembly the unga the un security council or the unsc the un secretariat the ecosoc or the economic and social council the trusteeship council and the icj or the international court of justice these are the six primary organs of the united nations the un general assembly has membership of all the countries all the member states in the world today it has around 193 member states unga functions like a policy making body it functions like a deliberative institution which deliberates on key global issues it comprises of all the members of the un and the pressing issues of the world 
right? Be it related to environment, be it related to economic development, or be it related to a conflict, any issue which is affecting the world can be brought up here through resolutions and the UNGA will act as a policy making body, as a deliberative body which will debate on key global issues. It does have certain limited powers as well to enforce certain actions. But the UNSC, the UN Security Council, happens to be the most powerful organ of the UN and its composition is made up of 15 members. This includes the P5, the five permanent members of the UNSC, that is the United States, United Kingdom, France, Russia and China. These five global powers were nominated as the five permanent members of UNSC with 10 other countries being elected as non-permanent members who would be elected on a rotational basis. They would be elected for a two-year term on the basis of a geographical quota. So this is how the UN was structured and the UNSC became an elite body very quickly because the permanent members were vested with a tremendous power that is the veto. The P5 countries would enjoy a veto power through which they could veto any resolution. Even if a resolution is backed by all the other members of UN, just one member of the P5 could veto the entire resolution. Such tremendous powers were vested with the P5, thus making UNSC an elite organization. Largely undemocratic as well, because the UNGA, which was largely democratic on the other side, where every country had one equal vote, wasn't given the key powers. All key powers related to key issues were vested with UNSC, with P5 countries solely deciding on these issues. Be it the question of dealing with wars and conflicts and disputes, be it imposition of sanctions, be it providing authorization for the use of force against another country, or be it sensitive issues like nuclear disarmament, counter-terrorism, all such key subjects related to peace and security, those powers have been vested exclusively with the UN Security Council. And with the veto, the P5 countries get to dominate these global issues and we started seeing that these countries started playing geopolitics at the UN to protect their respective interests by misusing the veto power. So that's one reason why there, there is a, a strong push for reforming the UN beginning with reforming the UN Security Council. We'll talk a little more about it in the next topic. Next we have the International Court of Justice, which is based out of The Hague in Netherlands. It functions as the principal judicial organ of the UN and consists of 15 judges who are elected for a nine-year term by UNGA and the UNSC. So ICJ, basically resolves disputes between the member states. It also looks into any legal cases, disputes involving UN related organizations and specialized agencies. So that is the mandate of ICJ, primarily to settle disputes between UN members. Then trusteeship council was set up to administer the trust territories that were left behind after the world war. These trust territories were essentially colonies of Germany, Italy and other countries. So until they could become independent, until they could become fit for self-rule and self-governance, some of these trust territories around the world, they were directly administered by the UN. For this, a separate organ was created, the Trusteeship Council. By 1994, all the trust territories became independent. They merged with some countries, they became independent nations as well. So with this, the job of Trusteeship Council had come to an end. So now the Trusteeship Council has been wound up. It does not function anymore. We have ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council of the UN, which functions as a think tank of the UN, as a policy making body of the UN. Its primary focus is on welfare, socio-economic development, coming out with development goals, coming out with strategies and plans and assisting other countries to ensure that economic and social objectives of the UN are promoted. You would have heard about development goals like MDG, SDG, etc. The Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals. So these goals have been designed and, and set and these targets have been set by none other than the ECOSOC. And finally, you have the UN Secretariat, which is the executive arm of the UN. 
which takes care of the day-to-day -day functioning of the UN. So these are the principal organs of the United Nations and one has to be familiar with them and their functioning in order to understand why India is pushing for UN reforms, in order to understand the core issues that are affecting the functioning of the United Nations. So before we talk about UN reforms, let us stay with the same topic and see what India, what India did at the latest UN General Assembly session. India has made some important statements that could be very relevant for our exams. So let's just evaluate India's stand taken on some key issues at the latest summit and then we'll take up the second related topic where we will talk about UN reforms in complete detail. See, with regard to Russia-Ukraine war, India made its stand very clear. Until now, we have abstained from voting against Russia. Due to our close strategic relations, we have largely abstained from voting against Russia. But since the war has dragged and now it is affecting the global economy on a large scale, recently Prime Minister Modi, who interacted with, with Putin, called upon Russia to put an end to this unnecessary war. The same line has been reiterated by India's foreign minister as well and India has stated that we firmly stand with the founding principles of the UN Charter, which means we firmly support international peace and security. We support the core tenet, the core belief of UN Charter that no country should use unnecessary force against another country, which apparently Russia is currently doing against Ukraine. So India has made it clear that it would expect Russia to abide by the principles of the UN Charter. So this was a very important stand that India has taken that shows that India is probably trying to balance its position because until now we had indirectly or directly backed Russia by abstaining from the vote and also by bypassing the western sanctions on Russia. So in that context the slight shift in India's position becomes very relevant, very important. It shows that India is trying to nudge Russia to ensure that Russia takes a back step and puts an end to this conflict. Next, India used the opportunity at the UN General Assembly to highlight the key challenges that we are facing in our neighborhood and how we are assisting our neighbors who are going through a grave crisis. For example, Sri Lanka is facing its toughest economic crisis. So India brought up the issue and pointed out how India has provided financial and commodity assistance to the country. We have provided around 3.5 billion dollars in assistance to support the Sri Lankan economy. We have supplied essential commodities to help out the Sri Lankan people who are suffering from shortage of essential items. We brought up the current political crisis in Myanmar and pointed out how India has dispatched food aid or food assistance to help out the people of Myanmar who are suffering as a result of the emergency which has been declared by Myanmar's military janta. We even brought up the situation in Afghanistan following the takeover of Taliban and pointed out how India has helped the Afghan people by dispatching wheat, large amounts of wheat which was sent via Pakistan to Afghanistan. So this food aid has again helped the Afghan people. So India is trying to pitch its involvement in the neighborhood and how India is helping out the, the crisis hit countries in South Asia and beyond South Asia. This positioning of India is very important because it cl clearly projects India as a responsible and a leading power of the region and as well as the world. It further justifies India's stand that India is a major global power which is ready to take on such key challenges and assist other countries to protect human rights, to assist people during crisis and to end conflicts and to stabilize the region in line with the principles and the mandate of the UN Charter, right? So that is why the statement by India was very important. Next, India used the opportunity to criticize China and how it has politicized the 1267 Sanctions Committee of the UN Security Council. See, under UN Security Council, to counter terrorism, there is a Sanctions Committee which has been set up through UN Resolution Number 1267. This is the 1267 Sanctions Committee, also called the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or ISIS Sanctions Committee. So this Sanctions Committee consists of all the 15 members of UNSC and they vote on the basis of consensus. 
So this committee is meant for designating global terrorists. Individual terrorists can be designated as global terrorists by the sanctions committee if all the 15 members of UNSC back the resolution. Once an individual is listed as a global terrorist, immediate sanctions will apply on that designated terrorist. Three types of sanctions will apply. Every UN member will be mandated to freeze all the assets, the financial assets of the individual. All the financial assets that are linked to the individual, that are attached to the individual, they have to be immediately frozen. It basically places an economic sanction. Next, the movement of the terrorist has to be restricted and curbed by every country. He shouldn't be allowed to move around freely. If his presence is detected, he should be immediately detained and arrested by the UN member state. And it's an obligation on every UN member state. And finally, countries have to work towards restricting the availability of arms and weapons into the hands of these designated terrorists. Basically, the objective of the sanctions committee is to ensure that we can curb the ability of terrorists to organize large terror attacks. So India has designated few terrorists based out of Pakistan, such as Hafiz Saeed, the founder of lashkar e -Toyba, and we have got him designated as a global terrorist. After many years of effort, we got Masood Azhar, the founder of jaish e mohammed also designated as a global terrorist. But these attempts were blocked for many years by China as China was trying to shield Pakistan. Right? After years and years of effort, after the recent Pulwama terror attacks, there was a lot of pressure on China to remove the block. And finally, Masood Azhar was also designated as a global terrorist. But recently, just a few days back, India has brought up one more name at the sanctions committee, that is Sajid Mir, who is responsible for the Mumbai attacks, the 2611 Mumbai attacks. He is seen as a key conspirator, as a top ISI agent and a terrorist who backed and planned and executed the Mumbai attacks. So India has been trying to designate Sajid Mir through the sanctions committee, but again China has blocked India's resolution in order to shield Pakistan. So in this context, India has said that China is politicizing the sanctions committee and countries which are shielding terrorists like China and Pakistan, they will do this at their own peril because terrorism is bound to affect every country at the end of the day. So this is another key position that India took at the latest session. And finally, the last and, and the most important statement made by India at the General Assembly session was a strong push that was given for UN reforms. So this takes us to the next topic, which is G4 and the topic of UN reforms. This topic also dominated global headlines in the last few days, mainly because India, Brazil, then Germany and Japan. These four like-minded countries have given a renewed push for UN reforms and hence the topic of G4 and UN reforms was in news. These four countries have formed an informal grouping called G4 at the UN to push for UN reforms. So during the General Assembly session, India's foreign minister, he tweeted that he was glad to host the foreign ministers of G4 countries, as you can see in this image over here, where these four like-minded countries have coordinated their position to push the UN towards reforming the organization. Because India, Brazil, Germany and Japan, which are major powers today, which have emerged as key powers of the world, they have been pushing for UN reforms from at least 20 to 30 years. They believe that they have a legitimate claim to be a part of the UN, especially the UN Security Council to provide for global leadership. So in this context, we need to understand a little more about UN reforms and the stand that India has been taking to push the United Nations towards reforming this organization. So these members of G4, they have reiterated their support, their commitment to each other to push their proposal to become permanent members of UNSC. They have reiterated their support for African countries as well, which lack representation at the UN, both in a permanent and in a non-permanent capacity. There are several drawbacks in the current structure and in the composition 
of the United Nations. This is the core issue for countries like India and the other members of the G4. We have a, a core problem with the very structure of the UN. There is a structural flaw in which, in, in which the UN has been constituted. The composition, the functions of the UN, the powers that have been vested with few countries. These areas have been challenged by the G4 countries on the grounds of unfairness. On the grounds of not being representative and on the grounds of not reflecting the current geopolitical circumstances. See, you need to know that at the United Nations, representation at bodies like UNSC is on the basis of a geographical quota. Every geographical region is provided a certain representation. If you look at the P5, for example, one seat was provided for the entire Asia continent. Right? One seat was kept reserved for North America. For Europe and Eurasia region, the remaining three seats were kept reserved. It's on this basis of geographical representation that the P5 members were chosen. The seat from Asia was occupied by China. The seat from North America obviously went to US. And the seats, the three seats from Europe, Eurasia region went to Russia, the Soviet Union then, and UK and France. Even if you look at non-permanent category, even here there is a geographical quota. The 10 non-permanent members who are elected, they are elected on the basis of a geographical representation. But if you observe, there is a, there is a huge mismatch here, there is a structural flaw. Because many large regions of the world have been entirely excluded, entirely neglected. Latin America and Africa, for example, they find absolutely no place in the permanent category of the UN Security Council. There are no permanent members from Latin America and Africa, two of the largest regions of the world, right? The largest continent, Africa, has no representation. Asia, which has the world's largest population, has only one seat, one country is representing the entire Asia region. So there is a, a structural problem here, there is an inbuilt unfairness in the structure of the UN and that is the reason why the G4 countries are pushing for reforms of the institution. They are claiming a permanent seat for themselves as they believe that they have a legitimate claim as they have emerged as key powers of, of the current world and they are also pushing for fair representation to underrepresented regions, especially Africa. So if you look at the need for UN reforms, especially from a mains examination point of view, there are some key points which comes to our mind. Let's say UPSC asks you a question on why UN reforms is necessary or whether is India justified in pushing for UN reforms. If such a question comes, you need to point out that the very structure of the UN is outdated and flawed and its composition is still stuck in the world war era. It's an institution which was formed in the world war context. Back then, these P5 countries were the predominant powers. Right? Especially US, Soviet Union, UK and France. They were the predominant global powers of that era. And the structure of the UN reflects only the geopolitical context of the world war era. It hasn't taken into account the changes that have happened. Right? The new powers that have risen the former powers which have seen a decline in their influence, these changing geopolitical realities and circumstances have not been acknowledged. They have not been taken into account. And hence, experts argue that the UN today, especially UNSC, does not reflect current geopolitical realities. It has left out key powers like India and the other members of G4. It provides no representation to large regions like Africa and Latin America. And more importantly, the UNSC has become entirely dominated by the P5 and they have misused the platform for their geopolitics. They have politicized the UNSC by misusing their veto power. And they are using the veto, they are using the UNSC to fulfill their respective self-interests instead of serving the global interests. So this is India's primary argument. This is why we are pushing for the reforms of the institution. So India's foreign minister, 
he not only met with the foreign ministers of G4 countries to give a push for UN reforms, but India is also lobbying with other developing, underdeveloped nations so that we can build South-South cooperation and South-South support amongst the developing, underdeveloped countries. See, in international relations, the term North and South or Global North, Global South does not necessarily refer to directions. Global North in geopolitics or in international relations refers to the developed world, whereas Global South refers to developing, underdeveloped nations. So when developing underdeveloped countries are collaborating, when they are working together, it's often referred to as South-South cooperation. So India is seeking the support of other like-minded developing underdeveloped nations which have a stand against the P5, which have issues with the way the P5 countries are functioning. So India meets with an informal group called L69, which brings together many developing underdeveloped nations from Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, Asia and also the Pacific and the Oceania region. So India interacts with the L69 which brings 69 developing underdeveloped countries together and we are seeking their support as well to push for reforms of the UN. Is that clear? So at the UNSC we have something called Intergovernmental Negotiations or IGN. These intergovernmental negotiations they are supposed to push the UN towards reforming the institution. It is supposed to provide concrete results. It is supposed to work out the future structure and the framework of the UN and provide for the introduction of the UN reforms. But these intergovernmental negotiations have been stuck for several years because the P5 countries are not showing genuine interest in initiating text-based negotiations. All the support that some countries have given to India especially, it is verbal support. Within the P5, countries like US, Russia, France, UK, they have backed India's entry into UN UNSC. They say they completely support India's entry. Even during the latest session, US President Biden said that India has a rightful claim to become a member of UNSC. But this is purely verbal support, right? Verbal statements have no value unless it is put in, uh, unless it is put down or written down in text into a contract, into an agreement or a treaty. So India has been pushing for text-based negotiations through the IGN, through the intergovernmental negotiations. But unfortunately, there has been no progress. And UN reforms cannot happen without a special majority in UN General Assembly and complete support in the P5. All five countries of UNSC, the five permanent members, have to support such a resolution and it should have special majority in the UN General Assembly. Only then UN reforms will become a reality. So this is why UN reforms has been stalled. Because the P5 countries have no genuine interest to allow the reforms of the organization. They do not want to share their extraordinary powers with other countries like India, Germany or Japan or Brazil, right? They've been resisting these attempts. Developing countries, underdeveloped nations, many of them back UN reforms, but there are some countries which are opposed to G4 countries and they have formed their own informal group called the Coffee Club to oppose the push for UN reforms being given by G4 countries. The Coffee Club countries are essentially the regional rivals of G4 like Pakistan for India, South Korea for Japan, then Italy for Germany, Argentina for Brazil, their respective regional rivals who feel threatened by the push of G4, they are opposing UN reforms and entry of these countries into UNSC by forming another informal group called the Coffee Club. So it's due to these developments that UN reforms have been stalled for many years and India keeps insisting that the organization has to be reformed so that the emerged powers, the new emerged powers can also provide leadership to the world and help maintain stability in the world. Because otherwise, if UN is stuck in the world war era, if powers are concentrated in the hands of the P5, the UN will never be an effective organization. This is one of the reasons why the UN has become ineffective in solving or handling most of the key global challenges. So on this note, 
I would like to move to the next two topics. Both are a little small topics, but still very relevant for the exam. The third topic would be Paris Club. The Paris Club was in news because Pakistan has sought to extend its loan repayment to this body called Paris Club as it owes around $10 billion to the Paris Club. A few days back, Pakistan requested the Paris Club to reschedule the loan repayment as Pakistan is facing a severe economic crisis. I am sure many of you would be aware of this development because it's not a new development. Since quite a few years, Pakistan's economy has been facing a serious challenge. There is severe inflation in Pakistan. The Pakistani rupee, its currency has, has depreciated against the US dollar. Its debt has mounted over the years. And upon that, Pakistan was also hit by the Financial Action Task Force, which has placed Pakistan on its grey list for failing to tackle money laundering and terror financing. So getting grey listed by FATF has some consequences. It affects the flow of capital and investments into your country. Then along with this, Pakistan faced a devastating flood over the last few weeks and this disaster has put Pakistan under severe economic strain. Pakistan is struggling to revive its economy and today you might have read in newspapers and, and you, you might have seen the news that Pakistan has even replaced its finance minister today. A new finance minister has been appointed pointing out the extent of the crisis that Pakistan is going through. So to ensure that Pakistan has some space to look after disaster management, to help the people who are affected by the floods and it has enough resources to provide immediate relief to the flood victims, it has sought a rescheduling of the loan repayment from Paris Club and has also submitted a fresh request to IMF for another $3 billion loan to help support the economy which is at the brink of collapse. So this brings us to the topic of Paris Club. We need to understand what is Paris Club, what is its importance and we should also talk about Pakistan's economic situation in slight detail. So the Paris Club is closely linked with the G20 common framework and it's an arrangement, it's an informal arrangement between few countries through which financial assistance is given, financial assistance is extended to countries which are categorized as debtor countries. These are the countries that borrow loans from the creditor countries. So when it comes to global finance, we have two categories of countries. One is the creditor countries which offer loans, which provide loans to others. And the other group of countries are debtor countries which borrow loans from other countries. So these debtor countries which are often small, poor countries who are facing economic challenges, they end up borrowing loans from other countries, from creditor nations, and they also borrow from global institutions like IMF, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, etc. So quite often, these debtor countries might face a crisis. They may not be able to repay the loan on time. Right? So in those circumstances, the Paris Club helps out these countries by lending more money or by restructuring the loan itself. So this club was established in 1956. Since then it has been evolving and it currently has 22 permanent members. The members are listed over here. It's predominantly led by the Western countries with few exceptions like Russia and others. So most members of the Paris Club are largely the developed Western nations. These are the creditor nations that provide loans and financial assistance to other countries. So these countries have appointed their officials to form this informal group called the Paris Club. It's a group of officials from these countries. So these creditor nations will try to assist the debtor countries if they are facing a financial crisis like Pakistan is currently facing. They will also help in 
restructuring the loans if they are not able to repay the loan on time. They will work out a new repayment schedule. They will try to work out a flexible repayment method so that the small countries which are under a debt burden, they need not be forced to pay the loan back immediately. They are given extended deadlines. The debt ob obligations, the debt service obligations are restructured and the deadlines are pushed back. And through this flexible framework, they help out the debtor countries to survive for the time being, to give themselves some space so that they can rebuild their economies and eventually pay the loans back to the creditor nations. Is that clear? So Paris Club plays a key role in this regard. It provides financial assistance to small poor countries, to the debtor nations and helps them out as well during their financial crisis. So Pakistan, which has been facing a serious crisis for many years, it has borrowed heavily from global financial institutions like World Bank and IMF. It has borrowed heavily from the Paris Club as well. It has also borrowed from the non-Paris countries, non-Paris club countries, like China, for example. Right? China has offered massive loans to Pakistan and Pakistan is in no position to repay them. It is yet to repay the loans taken from World Bank, IMF and other institutions. So now it is facing a difficulty to repay the Paris club. So it has sought an extension in the deadline and it is requesting Paris club for restructuring the loan and the repayment schedule. So this is where you have to understand that Pakistan is also facing a serious crisis much like Sri Lanka. Its external debt stands at a massive 97 billion dollars as of June this year. Out of this at least 10 billion dollars is owed by Pakistan just to the Paris club. It owes hundreds of millions of dollars to other countries like France, Germany, US which has been borrowed bilaterally apart from lending through Paris club. Pakistan also has to repay China for all the loans it has taken, for all the investments China has made in Pakistan. Right? So right now Pakistan is in no position to make these repayments. Hence, it has sought an extension for an immediate payment of $1.1 billion. In total, it owes $10 billion to the Paris club. Right? And immediately it was supposed to pay $1.1 billion. So on this immediate payment, Pakistan has sought an extension. It has requested Paris club countries to reschedule and restructure the loan so that Pakistan will get some breathing space as the country is facing its biggest disaster, its biggest crisis. So that it can utilize the money that's immediately available to help out the flood victims instead of channeling this towards loan repayment. So that is why Pakistan's economic crisis was in news along with the Paris club. So such key institutions can be very important for our prelims and also for our mains. Now coming to the last topic for the day, we shall talk about the current status of the Russia-Ukraine conflict and a recent decision by Russia to carry out troop mobilization. It's a big development. It's a very important development. So let's examine this in slight detail and conclude today's session. See, earlier this week, Russian President Putin he came out and made a, a public statement. He updated the Russian public about the conflict against Ukraine, appeared to put, a bra put up a brave face by claiming that Russia was still making progress in the war and he called upon Russians to help the country and he ordered Russia's first troop mobilization since the Second World War. Now this was contradictory. On one side, the Russian president was saying all is well with the conflict. On the other hand, he has given a call for troop mobilization, which happens to be the first such order by Russia, by, uh, by the successor state of Soviet Union, to mobilize troops. This, the last time it was done was during Second World War. See, a mobilization of troops is nothing but a call given for reservists or reserve soldiers, sometimes even the common public to take up arms and to contribute to the war efforts. This is usually a desperate measure, right? When a country is at war, it will rely on the trained armed forces, the trained soldiers. When it is falling short of manpower, that is when a country will give a call for mobilization and this is an emergency martial law provision, right? A martial law would be 
placed in a country where the orders cannot be disobeyed any refusal to obey the orders will invite strict punishment and under these martial orders under these emergency powers the common public the reservists are mobilized by the government so that more human resource more manpower can be brought into the armed forces which is depleting in its strength it's usually a desperate call it's a desperate measure to increase the number of troops to engage in the conflict so strategic experts have pointed out that the call given by russia for troop mobilization it's a direct result of the major setback that russia has suffered in ukraine in the battlefield since the conflict began in february 2022 russia did make some rapid advances at the beginning but in the last few months ukraine has fought back bravely mainly with the backing of nato nato countries led by us and european nations they have not only supplied weapons to ukraine but they have also helped in training ukraine's reserve soldiers ukraine also had mobilized its common public and former soldiers to come to the support of the armed forces so with this backing from western countries with advanced training from them advanced weapons from them ukraine has put up a brave front and it has pushed back against russia at least in some parts right in some of the battlefields ukraine has made some advances and recently russia suffered its biggest reversal in the battlefield i'll show you a map and explain what exactly happened in the battlefield what what exactly is the presence of russian and ukrainian forces and what is the ground situation along the front lines but before that you need to understand that russia's call for troop mobilization has come immediately after it suffered its biggest battlefield defeat in this conflict that clearly shows that russia is under pressure right it is feeling weakened it's feeling that it may not be achieving its desired objectives and as a desperate measure to boost its armed strength on the front lines to bring in more soldiers on the front lines it has given a call for reservists who are basically former soldiers or those who have military experience military skills or in general any fit people who fall in a certain age bracket who can be trained they're all given a call by the government to join the armed forces and with basic training they are put into the battlefield right this is usually a desperate emergency measure and russia has resorted to this and according to reports it is looking to mobilize at least 3 lakh reservists most of whom are former soldiers retired soldiers right or those who have some military experience or in general the fit and uh, able youth right those who fall between the bracket of 18 to 60 years both men and women can be mobilized by the government for such mobilization so in this context we need to understand the battlefield situation along the russia ukraine front line this gives you an important update on the progress of the war the current status of the conflict and it also puts in perspective what india has said about the conflict see when russia attacked ukraine earlier this year in february 2022 it mounted a all round attack it attacked ukraine from the north with the help of belarus with the objective of capturing kiev the capital of ukraine right russia came very close to the outskirts of kiev it mounted a major assault in the northeast of ukraine targeting kharkiv where most indian students were stuck along with sumi right its main focus was on the eastern provinces here in the donbas region where russia has been backing a separatist movement since 2014 so russian forces invaded ukraine here as well in the luhansk donetsk provinces and russia even recognized them as breakaway provinces as autonomous provinces so this was a major front line where the conflict is still going on and the other major assault was from the south in the kherson province stretching all the way from here from crimea which has been occupied by russia in 2014 going all the way up till the mariupol port that you see here facing the sea of azov so these are the major front lines that russia opened when it invaded ukraine it attacked ukraine from the north from the northeast from the east and from the south now the current status is that russia has been defeated in the north right this happened many months back many many weeks back ukraine put up a tough resistance at kiev at the capital and pushed back the russian invasion and managed to secure the north recently in the northeast where russian forces had occupied ukrainian territory 
Ukraine put up a brave resistance and it has defeated Russian forces here and forced them to retreat back into Russia. This is the biggest battlefield defeat for Russia in the current conflict. Ukraine has recaptured most of these areas in and around Kharkiv. This is the big setback that has triggered panic in Russia, triggered criticism against Putin and the Russian government as well, especially by ultra-nationalist elements. Ultra-nationalists in Russia are calling for more aggression in the war, right? And this has brought Russia under tremendous pressure as it has suffered a big defeat, a battlefield defeat, and has been pushed out of Kharkiv. So in this context, Russia is panicking and the signs are very visible, right? Even in Kherson, in the south, Ukraine is putting up a brave fight. They are slowly gaining ground and putting up a resistance against Russian forces. But Russia does remain in control in the eastern provinces here, in the Donbass region of Donetsk and Luhansk. And that is why Russia has taken two desperate steps last week. It announced two desperate steps emergency measures following this defeat in the battlefield in Kharkiv in the northeast region of Ukraine. First, it announced a referendum in Donetsk and Luhansk. Basically, it called for a direct election where the people of the separatist hit region will vote to liberate the region from Ukraine and most likely Russia would be looking to annex these territories. According to estimates, if Russia were to annex the Donbass region of Donetsk and Luhansk, 15% of Ukrainian territory would be lost to Russia. So Russia is looking to cement these gains at least to hide the failures in the north and the northeast. This would give Russia some, some advantage to claim victory in the war by occupying and annexing at least 15% of Ukrainian territory. The second desperate measure announced by Russia was the troop mobilization. Like I said, it's a desperate measure to call back reservist soldiers, to call upon the public in general to mobilize and to join the armed forces. Right? So this has triggered panic across Russia, across Russian cities. Russian Defense Ministry has prepared a list of those who are being called back and many of them who are not interested in this war. They are trying to run away. They are booking flights. There is a sudden increase in, in the number of flights going out of Russia. People are trying to run away from the borders as well to cross into Europe. Otherwise, you, you have no choice but to forcefully join the armed forces and contribute to the war efforts. Right? So Russia has even enacted a law to back the true mobilization plan. The Russian parliament introduced a law under the martial powers which are in place and declares any disobeyal order any disobeyal of orders as a criminal offense. So those who abandon the army, those who desert the forces, those who refuse to join the forces, right? They will be treated as deserters and they will be punished very strictly under the martial laws that are in place. This clearly shows that Russia is desperately trying to reinforce the front lines in Ukraine, especially in the east and south to retain whatever advances it has made. Or else here as well Russia might face a defeat because it's very evident that Russian forces are struggling to hold the positions in the east and south as well. So now the only option for Russia is to further escalate the war. Right? That is why Putin on one side is deliberately threatening a possible nuclear war as well. Just to put western countries on the back foot. Right? On the other hand, the troop mobilization is clearly seen as a desperate move to bring in more manpower, to bring more soldiers to the front lines. But the question will remain on their efficacy. Because these soldiers, former soldiers and the common public, they may not have enough combat experience. They may not be well trained. There are also questions on Russian military equipment. Russia might have exhausted a large stockpile of its arms and weapons. So this has put Russia in a very difficult spot. And the desperation is clearly showing, the signs are clearly there that Russia is getting prepared for a do or die situation. Now this might bring an end to the conflict as well, where Russia might annex those small territories of Donetsk and Luhansk and declare victory in the war and end the war. Right? That is a positive outcome. But there could be a negative outcome as well, where Russia is pushed into a corner and it might push Russia to commit something very aggressive in order to 
ensure that it claims victory in the war and that might possibly include a potential nuclear scenario as well right so this is what experts are pointing out about the current status of russia ukraine conflict so on this note i would like to bring my session to an end we have covered four important topics that would be helpful for your prelims and mains so do catch the session every week every wednesday we'll go live at 8 pm don't forget to watch the session for a complete summary and a complete revision of key of all the key geopolitical developments that have happened in the last one week so if you like the session do hit the like button support us by sharing your comments share these videos with other aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel thanks for watching